everyone's favorite new seasonal unit, the new tier 5 phalanx unit, is finally able to be unlocked. Through Booming's new creator program, I was able to get a max level version of this unit to showcase this unit for this unit overview video. In the rest of this video, I'm going to be going over the attributes, characteristics, veterancy, doctrines, abilities, and gameplay tips for this unit. I've added chapters below if you want to skip around, so feel free to do that. If this is your first introduction to Conqueror's Blade, or you're a long-time returning player who's going to make a new account, check out the links in the description of this video to download the game on Steam, or use the code below that to redeem it in-game for some additional rewards. Okay, so let's first take a look at the Phalanx attributes here. So the attributes are actually pretty interesting if we look at these here. So since the PTR, their health did get bumped up a little bit to above 10,000, which is nice to see. They were a little bit squishy in my opinion and in a lot of people's opinion in the PTR. So that's good to see. So their health is 10,500. That's a little bit lower than uh, Fort Abrasios and Halb Sergeants, which are a little bit higher around 11,000. Obviously, their leadership is going to cost more. They cost out of season, they're going to cost 300 leadership, which is the same as other tier 5 golden units like Iron Reapers and Celadars. So that's kind of in line with everything else. They actually have the biggest unit in the game at 40 strength. That's compared to 32 for Fort Abrasios and obviously a lot less for Halb Sergeants at 26. Um, some other interesting stats here. So their piercing armor pin is 2260 and piercing damage 1600. That is actually very comparable to Fort Brassio's at almost 2200 and 1650 here as well. Um, and I won't go over the defense attributes, but essentially their defense attributes are again very similar to Fort Brassio's. So what you see here, that's going to be essentially very similar to also what you see for the Phalanx if we go back to Menasek. So I just want to point this out. So from a base stat level, they're actually very comparable to these Fort Abrasio stats that we see here. The main difference is, is they're going to be a little faster at, I think it was 4.5 speed. Obviously, they're going to cost more leadership at 300 for our tier 5 golden unit. And they're going to have eight more troops. So they're going to have 40 strength instead of 32 here. And then health is a little bit more for Fort Abrasios, but pretty comparable overall. So the main reason I'm pointing this out is it's actually pretty interesting because a lot of the base stats between Fort Abrasios and the Phalanx unit over here are very similar actually, which on the face of it you think is kind of weird. You'd think a tier 5 unit should have a lot better stats, but actually where this unit makes up for that is really in its characteristics and its abilities and its versatility. So that being said, let's go ahead and take a look at the unit traits that make these guys like a souped up version of Fort Abrasio Pikeman. So the first one of note here is Sakanian Pikes. So this is saying that the unit's long pikes cause extra damage to cavalry. So damage taken from cavalry while bracing is reduced by 15%, but this unit will not be able to attack at close range. So they're going to take reduced damage from cavalry, but if the cavalry is actually able to penetrate the formation and get right on top of the troop, they're actually not going to be able to attack the cavalry. So of course they're going to be really good in a head-on bracing situation, but let's say you're going against winged hussars who are able to get through your formation, or you're attacked from the flank or slightly to the side and they're able to get through, now you're probably going to have to move into a dispersed formation and be attack them to actually kill the cavalry because of this uh, drawback that you get from Sakanian pikes. So you will take less damage of course, but it will mean you're going to need to move to a dispersed formation to actually kill the cavalry because you're not going to be able to attack if they're right on top of your unit. The second unit trait here is Imperial Anvil. So attacks during brace inflict days on the enemy and additionally apply the Star of the Horses effect to cavalry. So Star of the Horses effect is essentially when the cavalry rear up and it stops their charge. So importantly, this will now impact Juanwia Heavy Cavalry who recently lost their immunity in their 2 ability. So they're now going to be able to trade effectively with Juanwia Heavy Cavalry. They're of course going to be able to trade effectively with most other cavalry as well who are susceptible to this effect. And for the last positive unit trait down here, we have more is generosity. So this gives the unit gain reversal of fate, which prevents one instance of lethal damage. All control effects are removed when reversal of fate takes effect, and they will begin restoring this effect after not having been hit for 30 seconds. So this is pretty similar to that seasonal rune that basically prevents you from dying for a short amount of time. So that is basically giving that to this unit. So essentially it's just making the unit more survivable, especially in situations where they're going to take a big chunk of damage all at once. So I think the main situation where this will actually be impactful is let's say you get charged from the flank by cavalry. That would normally wipe your entire unit if the cavalry is dealing a ton of damage. But now instead they're going to gain reversal of fate. So they might be able to resist for basically one second longer and get an additional attack on that cavalry. So your unit might still get wiped from a cavalry flanking charge, but at least they'll be able to get one extra attack in and trade effectively with that unit that came and charged you. This unit does have one negative unit trait in Encumbered, but I think it's going to be pretty inconsequential. So the unit is burdened with heavy equipment and thus cannot push siege engines or climb ladders. Again, I don't think there's many situations where you'd even want to climb ladders or push siege engines with these guys, so I really don't think this will matter too much. I'm not sure what the point of even having it 
in the game like this was, but either way, I don't think it's gonna matter one way or the other. Just to quickly cover the formations and unit orders, I'm gonna go over this in a lot more detail in the abilities section if you wanna go to that chapter, but essentially they're gonna have three formations. One is a dispersed formation, one is a block formation, so that's obviously gonna be that dense block formation that you'd expect from a phalanx unit. And then they're gonna have this shieldtron formation where you can form up if you're worried about getting flanked from the sides. So in the most cases, I think you'll basically wanna be in block formation if you're in a city fight and going down a big aisle of your choke point, and then shieldtron formation for cases where you don't wanna get flanked, and then dispersed if you need to kill guys in a blob or not get your whole unit taken out by one charge. For the unit orders here, we have a little bit of a change from the PTR here. So now brace is broken down into two different bracing effects. So the first one is your standard brace where they just sit there and brace and it has all the benefits of bracing that you normally expect and from the unit traits. So they have that brace effect. You can hit V in this effect, which makes them attack around them while still bracing. The other thing you can do is have this roaming brace. And again, I'll show this off in the abilities in some more detail, but it essentially allows them to move forward or backward. Think like an IPG walk, but you can control this and it's continuous. So you'll still be in brace, but you can move forward or backward. What I don't actually know is if there's any hidden bonuses from being in this standard brace where you stand still versus the roaming brace. It doesn't say there's any, but I kind of think there could be some hidden bonuses with this standard brace versus the roaming brace. Otherwise, I'm not sure why they would distinguish these. Maybe it's just so that people don't get confused on the fact that you can move forward and backward with the brace, which is not a standard thing for this brace effect. So it could just be that, but I'm not totally sure at this time. The other effect they get is this Ares Fury. So they'll basically lunge in front of them and deal an attack that deals heavy damage to units in front of them. This will leave the brace formation, so just note that when you use it. The last unit order here is Divine Gaze, which is essentially just a damage buff. So basically you'll mark a circular area of around eight meters. Any enemies that are stuck within that area will gain a stack of exposure. This can stack up to 10 times, but these stacks are lost after five seconds. Any phalanx unit will deal 40% increased damage to enemies that have built up at least five stacks of expose. So basically just think of any enemies within this area after a certain amount of time will be dealt a lot of extra damage by phalanx unit. So this essentially just means that the phalanx will be able to deal even more damage in continuous fights. For the phalanx veteran seat, you basically have two options here. You have a top line build, which is focused around the Ares flurry ability, which is this burst ability that makes you lead the brace formation. So that can be good if you want to burst down enemy heroes or in big blob fights. Importantly, the last node of the top line gives you a 30% chance to knock down enemy units, which is pretty cool. However, I still think most people will just go for the bottom line here, which gives you better brace damage and damage reduction, as well as the most important thing at the end of this line, which is each of your units can attack one additional enemy while in their brace formation. So that's going to be really good, especially given the troop size of 40. So I think most people will mainly go for the bottom line to focus on bracing. Um, that will be, I think, better in high-level sieges and territory wars. This is more, I think, just a fun build if you want to go for burst damage to burst down some heroes if you're holding down a choke point or alleyways. For the Phalanx Doctrines, they're going to be a polearm unit, so you're going to use all your main doctrines that you would use for polearm units as well as the seasonal-specific doctrines. In particular, you want the ones around Divine Gaze, which you're going to pick up from the seasonal challenges, so that will, of course, be good to increase the damage output of this unit. And then outside of that, you'll likely just want your normal polearm doctrines, such as increased damage while bracing, things like epic polearm doctrines to deal more damage against cavalry or take less damage from cavalry. Just your standard polearm doctrines are likely what you're going to want to take for this unit. Okay, so for the phalanx abilities, you can see here we got into our brace ability, and then you'll see if we hit brace again by hitting one, you can see how we can walk forward. We'll also be able to walk backwards, so let me just show this off real quick. So we're marching forward, marching forward. You can combo this with the two ability, which is that stab burst ability. So you can see I can burst them down with that two ability, and then I can immediately walk them back. I think the text for the two ability actually says they get out of brace, but I've noticed they actually keep bracing afterwards, so that might be a mistake in the text. Um, if I hit V here, they're gonna stay in their brace and then attack around them. So if you're flanked, but you don't wanna change your formation, you can just hit V um, if there's kind of soldiers off to your flanks here. Let me kill this last troop so I can throw some other things here. Um, so that's kind of the brace and then the flurry ability, which is their burst ability with their two attack. Let me just reform them up. I'll form them up in the disperse formation so you can see that as well. So let me brace these guys. And then I'm going to use the three ability, the divine gaze. So like I mentioned earlier, this is going to basically create this circle. 
Now, I'm gonna do it once the enemies are close. As soon as they get in this circle, they're gonna start building up stacks, as you'll see in a sec. Once they have five stacks, they'll get a little red eye on them, like you can see here, and that means I'm gonna do extra damage against them. I believe it was a 40% damage increase. So as soon as they hit that, they'll get that red eye. You could combo this with this two burst really, and you'll just do a ton of damage to those enemies within that circle. So that's a good combo there. Notice how they don't attack the soldiers on the sides. They also can't attack soldiers that are right up on them, as you'll notice. So you'll definitely want to be um, V attacking in between bracing if the soldiers are getting too close to your units. Um, I'll show off one more thing here. I'll get into the shield tron formation. So this can be good in more of an open battle situation if there's kind of cav flanking you. So this covers all your flanks like this, and I'll just show them off. You can still brace in this formation. It's still pretty effective, and you won't be able to get flanked on any side, as you can see. Again, you can still use your two ability here, or your, and or your three ability as well. So again, you can just combo all these uh, abilities together. They work really well together. So this, as you can see, this unit is like pretty versatile. You're able to move around very easily. Let's say there's some archers here, so I can brace into these archers so that I'm still blocking, and if I don't just want to V-attack towards them, I can just slow march towards them to keep the blocks up. And also notice the blue blocking shield, that's from that other trait they got I mentioned that mitigates damage, so that improves their survivability, and you'll see that start to imp uh, regain that over time. You'll regain it slowly over time. And then once I'm close to the archers, I can just V-attack. They'll sit here, they won't be able to attack these archers in the back because they're still bracing, but of course if I V-move them, then I'll be able to kill the rest of these archers here. So play them pretty similar to how you play a Fort Abrasio, except you'll want to weave in just some standard Vs in with the advances from your brace ability, and I'll show off some gameplay with those tips in a sec as well. But yeah, that's really it for the formations and the abilities for this unit. So in this first clip, this is a good example of the versatility of the phalanx units. So I see the Swanui Heavy Cavalry coming around the corner, so I go and brace, and then I immediately pop down the damage buff, and then use my two burst ability, and I'm able to take out those Swanui Heavy Cavalry with very minimal losses on my side. I almost pick up the kill on that longbow. I noticed the mana arms group around the corner, so I was planning on going to attack them, but instead all of a sudden I'm getting flanked by another cav unit, but luckily I had V attacked, so my guys were able to turn around even in brace mode and kill off all of his cav units without taking much damage there too. So that just kind of shows you how you want to play them, but also the versatility they have, where even in a bad situation where you get flanked, they can still perform pretty well. This next clip is a really good example of how good this unit is in a blob pushing situation. So we're formed up on B here, we're about to engage a big team fight. I initially started getting on this ballista to try to take down the shield units, but I notice we're about to start the fight here as the Zakali militia moves up. And I see the enemies coming forward, so I immediately go to protect our troops here. So I immediately brace in front of those guys so that they can keep dealing damage to this big troop as they're going to get a lot of damage off here. So I immediately do a slow advance so they can't get to my halberdiers and Zakali militia. I also pop the Divine Gaze to bring that damage buff out, start building up those exposed stacks. And then I pop my two ability, the Ares Flurry, whenever I have it off cooldown to deal a lot of extra damage to the enemy troops and kill off any enemy heroes in the front lines. As you can see here, I make sure to manually reform up my troop whenever I fall too far behind so that I can keep supporting the push of our team. While the Phalanx unit wasn't the only key unit in this fight, it definitely was one of them as I set the front line for my team to allow the key DPS and Halberdiers and Zakali Militia to deal a ton of damage to that enemy blob and pick up 25 troop kills on my own. So in this final clip, this is the last home push after the B fight I just showed. So I noticed some Zakali Militia hiding around the corner, so go ahead and take those out before pushing in. This clip is really going to show the versatility of this unit. Um, I don't do a perfect job of playing in here, but I just think it's a really good clip to show this off. So I noticed some IPGs here. I don't want to go directly into them because I know they can walk me. So I advance cautiously once I realize we're going to take out their unit here. Um, we also have a lot of allies here, again, Halberdiers, and I think another Phalanx unit right here. I noticed I, uh, Iron Reaper charge coming in, so I tried to hit a two attack on those guys to deal a lot of damage before they hit me. Wasn't very successful, I didn't do a good job, but here we go, I noticed IPG walk coming in, so I actually advanced backwards to avoid that wall, hitting the exposed stacks on them, and then I'm going to two attack here to deal a lot of damage. So I help wipe out that unit, as well as the Iron Reaper unit, even with the depleted half unit that I have left at this point. Um, so still doing a decent amount of damage. I hit V attack on in there, but I did end up getting flanked by those Mermillions. A cab charge coming in. At this point, my unit's pretty much dead. You see that allied unit advances backwards and kills the cab unit with their phalanx unit, which is a pretty good play by them there. So this clip really showed off the versatility of this unit and its ability to snowball a game with coordination from your team and a few well-executed pushes like this. So just to summarize and wrap up how you want to play this unit, you're going to want to brace and then use your one advance to support your allied pushes and big blob fights. You'll want to advance backwards to avoid IPG walks or cab charges, 
In between your advances, you'll likely want to hit V while in brace to be able to cover your flanks as well as stopping your advance when you want to stop and change your advance direction. You'll also want to use your Divine Gaze ability to build up those exposed stacks and boost the damage of your unit, as well as using your 2 Ares Flurry ability whenever it's off cooldown to burst down enemy units and heroes. But yeah, that's really all the gameplay tips I have for you guys in this unit. I'm really liking the unit so far. I love how versatile it is and how active the gameplay with the unit is. The unit is pretty versatile and does require a bit of a learning curve to actually get good with the unit, so you will have to contend with that. But yeah, let me know in the comments what you guys think about the unit so far. And other than that, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I'll see you out on the battlefield.